Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the biology topics. This is breathing and gas exchange. We're going to begin by talking about respiration and breathing. Respiration is a process of release of energy from cells by oxidation of foods like glucose. In animals, aerobic respiration takes place inside the mitochondria or we could say in eukaryotes. In this process, oxygen is going to be used up and carbon dioxide is going to be produced. So this oxygen required has to be supplied while the carbon dioxide produced has to be taken away. So a gas exchange system is going to ensure the continuous supply of oxygen as well as the removal of carbon dioxide from the body so that body processes can go on smoothly. Here we see an example of a muscle cell and the process of aerobic respiration is taking place. We see glucose is reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide water and ATP. This ATP is the energy source that drives most processes within cells. So the glucose is going to come from this blood capillary and then enter the muscle cell. Oxygen is also going to enter from the capillary. But after respiration, these products may have to get out from the muscle. So they will enter into the capillary and they're going to be taken away back to the lungs so that oxygen and carbon dioxide can be exchanged, meaning oxygen will enter into the tissues of the lungs while carbon dioxide gets out in order for breathing out to occur and expel the CO2 out of the body. Like we said already, the gas exchange system is important to deliver oxygen and remove carbon dioxide in order for aerobic respiration to be sustained. So this is how the gas exchange system looks like. It is enclosed within the thorax. This is the thorax. Uh, we can see the rib cages. These are the rib cages. If you see here, these ones here are the ribs. And between the ribs, we have the muscles called the intercostal muscles, as well as the diaphragm, which is formed down here. So the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm participate in changing the volume as well as the pressure within the thoracic cavity so that more oxygen comes in or the CO2 can be pushed out. The diaphragm is a muscular tissue like we see here. It can contract to flatten or it can relax in order to go back to this dome shape. So looking at the components of the gas exchange system, I'm going to begin with the trachea. The trachea is lined with mucus secreting goblet cells and cilia on the surface that move the mucus and any trapped microorganisms as well as dust out of the lungs. Then we go to the rings of cartilage we can see here. These prevent the trachea as well as the bronchi from collapsing. I'm talking about these. That way the gas exchange system is going to be open for efficient gas exchange or for efficient inhalation as well as exhalation. Next we talk about the bronchi. Here we have the left bronchus. Bronchus is singular and bronchi is plural. The bronchi are tubes that lead to the lungs with cartilage to keep them open. Then we go to the bronchioles. These are small tubes that spread through the lungs and end in the alveoli. The alveoli are the main site for gas exchange in the lungs. The ribs are bony cartilage around the gas exchange system, basically for protection. Intercostal muscles, these are formed between the ribs. They move air into and out of the lungs in order to maintain a steep concentration gradient for gaseous exchange. The pleural membranes surround the lungs and line the chest cavity, forming a sterile sealed unit. And this cavity here contains the pleural fluid. The fluid is there for lubrication. It allows the membranes to slide easily with the breathing movements. Then, like I said already, this muscular diaphragm is a sheet of tissue made of tendons and muscle that form the flow of the chest cavity, important in breathing movements. Next, we go to ventilation. Here, we're going to be talking about inhalation as well as exhalation. Inhalation is when air enters into the lungs and exhalation, this is when air is pushed or goes out of the lungs. The process of ventilation maintains a steep concentration gradient for diffusion between the blood capillaries and the air in the lungs. During inhalation, the diaphragm is going to contract and flatten, we can see here. The external intercostal muscles are going to contract while the internal intercostal muscles are going to relax. So the chest cavity moves upwards and outwards. This increases the thoracic volume while the thoracic pressure decreases below atmospheric pressure so air is going to be drawn into the lungs. So in forced exhalation, the diaphragm is going to relax and it will become dome-shaped. The external intercostal muscles are going to relax while the internal intercostal muscles are going to contract. The chest cavity moves inwards and downwards. This decreases the thoracic volume but increases the thoracic pressure above atmospheric pressure. So air is going to be forced out of the lungs. 
Next, we go to gas exchange in the alveoli. We begin by looking at the table that shows the percentage composition in inhaled as well as exhaled air. Nitrogen is about 78% and in exhaled air is about 79%. There is no big difference here. That is because during respiration or in cellular processes, nitrogen is not produced, so we do not see a significant increase in the percentage. You could actually say 78, 78. This increase could be due to the nitrogen already present in the lungs. Then oxygen is 21% in inhaled air. However, in exhaled air, we see it's 16%. This means oxygen has been used up because less comes out in the exhaled air. Carbon dioxide concentration is 0.04%. We see a 4%. The increase is 100 times. We can see times 100. So a lot of CO2 is produced during respiration. And that's why this exhaled air has a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in comparison to the inhaled air. And for other gases, the composition is the same. 1%, 1% because respiration does not increase the concentration of those gases. The next we look at the alveoli and gas exchange. There is a network of blood capillaries surrounding the whole unit. This is because we need oxygen to be taken away immediately and carbon dioxide to be removed in order to maintain a steep concentration gradient. So in this figure here, we can see the adaptation of the alveoli for gas exchange. In the lungs, there are numerous alveoli. This provides greater surface area for gas exchange. And these alveoli, like we see here, are surrounded by multiple blood capillaries to ensure that oxygen is taken away immediately and carbon dioxide is removed to maintain a steep concentration gradient. And then the capillaries are one cell thick on this side. Also, we see the alveoli, it's one cell thickness. So the distance the substances have to diffuse is shorter and that speeds up the rate of diffusion of gases and gas exchange is gonna be faster. This is an experiment to compare the amount of carbon dioxide in inhaled as well as exhaled air. So in this setup, we're gonna have lime water or a hydrogen carbonate indicator in both of the test tubes. We are going to seal the unit so that atmospheric air does not interfere with the experiment. And then this connecting tube here is to ensure that atmospheric air can go through only that tube. So when the air goes through this tube, the carbon dioxide contained in that air is going to react with lime water and maybe we'll see something turn cloudy. But because the person is breathing in and out here, this is the breathing unit, our uh, air coming from here is going to go through this tube and all the way to there when the person breathes in. And when they breathe out, air is going to go here into this unit and go into this solution. Could be lime water or hydrogen carbonate indicator. And because exhaled air has a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, if we use lime water, this is going to turn cloudy faster in comparison to that. And if we use the hydrogen carbonate indicator, we're gonna see a color change from red to yellow. This is gonna show a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in comparison to this one here because in atmospheric air, there is a lower concentration of carbon dioxide, which is about 0.04. And we saw in exhaled air, it could be about 4%. Next, we go to an experiment to study the effect of exercise on breathing. This is described in your textbook. So you could get some participants and allow them to sit quiet in a specific place in order to relax so that we can concentrate on their normal breathing rate. We'll count the number of breaths per minute and record in a table, and we will repeat this until they have a steady resting heart rate. This could be five minutes, less or more, depending on the person, but usually it should be five minutes so that we can see a steady continuous heart rate. And then you allow the participant to perform vigorous exercise for about three minutes. Immediately after the three minutes, allow them to sit down and record the number of breaths per minute as before exercise. You'll repeat every minute until they return to their normal resting heart rate. Record the results in a table for interpretation. Their breathing heart rate does not return to normal immediately because oxygen has to be delivered to the muscles in order to overcome oxygen debt. Remember during exercise, some anaerobic respiration takes place. There is gonna be a lot of lactate produced within the muscles. This has to be broken down. So oxygen is required. That is why these people continue to breathe deeply even after exercise in order to overcome the oxygen debt for lactic acid or lactate to be removed from the body. If you're comparing people who are healthier and those who are not, the healthier people or those who normally exercise are gonna to return to their normal breathing heart rate faster than those who do not exercise. You have to make sure 
the variables are controlled. For example, if you're using like three or four students for this exercise, ensure they are the same age, same gender, they have the same level of activity and so on, so that the results are valid. Lastly, we'll look at the effects of smoking. I'm going to begin with bronchitis. Bronchitis occurs because chemicals within the smoke destroy the cilia. When the cilia are destroyed, the mucus cannot be efficiently swept away from the lungs. Remember around mucus secreting cells, there are cells containing cilia. The purpose of the cilia is to sweep away the mucus because this mucus traps some microorganisms as well as dirt. But if the cilia are destroyed, then this mucus cannot be efficiently swept away and it's going to block the passage of the lungs. So the sufferers have to cough constantly in order to push this mucus out of their lungs. Since this mucus also traps bacteria, there is a higher chance of infection from pathogenic bacteria by the sufferers and it leads to breathing difficulties. The next one is emphysema, like we see here. In emphysema, again, the smoke particles contain chemicals which destroy the walls of the alveoli, causing them to break down and fuse together like we see here. This is before and this is after. The breakdown decreases the surface area for gaseous exchange, meaning there is going to be less oxygen transported through their blood vessels to the tissues, so there will be less aerobic respiration, less ATP is going to be generated, and they will have less energy for activity, so they will have difficulties even in mild activities like working because their cells or muscle cells do not have enough ATP due to insufficient aerobic respiration. The other is lung cancer. Again, some of the chemicals in the cigarettes are carcinogens, meaning they will lead to lung cancer. So the lungs of the sufferer are going to be destroyed, and over time this could lead to death. Another gas produced during smoking is carbon monoxide, and this has negative effects because it competes with oxygen for the stem site on hemoglobin, since hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide in comparison to oxygen, when you are in a region of higher concentration of carbon monoxide, your red blood cells are going to carry more carbon monoxide in comparison to oxygen, and that means the body cells are not getting sufficient oxygen, so less aerobic respiration will take place, less ATP is going to be generated for cellular activity. If the concentration of carbon monoxide is so high, then oxygen will not be delivered to the cells, and the person could die. And among pregnant women, smoking leads to low fetal mass or low birth weights. This usually comes in case studies in the exams, so you need to remember that. So this brings us to the end of this video talking about breathing and gas exchange. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.